Welcome to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. How we consume it and how it informs our everyday culture. I'm Christian Sager, a writer and a designer. And I'm Charlie Bennett, a librarian and a radio raconteur. Each episode is us trying to understand the entertainment world that we all live in just a little bit better. Today's episode is about Super Chunk's Foolish. This 1994 indie rock album means a lot to its fans as proof positive that you can survive a romantic breakup. We look at the small business that drove its creation and try to put ourselves in the shoes of the listeners that it's so important to. You can find show notes at patreon.com slash supercontext where you can leave a comment or you can write us an email at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com. What's your favorite breakup album so i've been thinking about nostalgia a lot yeah Uh, i know yeah and we've talked about it and then this record uh turns out to have been a an object of nostalgia that i did not know existed until the moment that it arrived in my post youth Uh uh-huh what does post youth mean means this uh decrepit right now that you see right now yeah <clears throat> i had a bet with my wife <clears throat> here's Ooh. what i said okay do i it. said charlie is going to approach this episode one of two ways it's either going to be what is this and why do people like it i don't understand it <laughs> or it's going to be how did i possibly miss this in the 90s everybody knew about this but me um neither but the second one is much more in line. So yeah, of the two paths that I usually take with stuff I've never heard. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. I'm more in lines of uh oh, okay. Gosh, Super Chunk doesn't sound like I thought Super Chunk sounded. Uh-huh. And in fact, as I confessed to uh, my friend this morning, because I'd never heard Super Chunk or Supergrass, whenever someone mentioned they either the one of them, band? they were the same band, but, <laughs> but I didn't have any idea of what they sounded like. So it wasn't like I was thinking, Oh yeah, Supergrass, They're that band that did foolish. I just, they were both the same band that I had never heard. Okay. Yeah. Whereas I'm coming from a totally different standpoint of, uh, while I'm not like a big fan of super chunk, I've been listening to them since I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people around me, we're big super chunk fans. I dated a girl in high school who was a really big fan, uh, specifically of the record before foolish. She really liked no Pocky for kitty. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is a band that like I've seen, I've heard playing in the background many times. I don't own any of their records, but I like them. Yeah. And so when you listen to foolish, the 1994 album, is 1994 immediately available to you in memory? Uh, more 1995, specifically okay. because I saw Super Chunk play in 1995 on Lansdowne Street at a WFNX festival, and this was the lineup. Uh, Shudder to Think, Super Chunk, Mike Watt, and Morphine. And it was like an outdoor free show. And I hadn't moved to Boston yet, but I drove (laughs) down and stayed the night with one of my buddies who was going to college in Boston. And we just went to that show and it was like, it was pretty amazing, you know, and I already knew super chunk stuff, but like that lineup was wild. I am deeply envious of that show. (laughs) Yeah, that's right in your wheelhouse. WFNX is is pretty much like the Charlie radio station. Like like the stuff that they played and specifically the stuff they focused on promoting in the 90s was very much like your stuff. Did they become the new metal station that I listened to when I was up there? I mean, they might have had blocks that were like that, but WFNX has always been known for sort of the alternative mainstream okay there there was a a station that i listened to i've talked about it before but it's been a while and uh, it had a regular morning show crew Mm -hmm. right down to the kind of the kind of kind of high voice kind of talking like this guy and and the very low voice very cool i'm jackson (laughs) you know and and then a, a a group of of malcontents a motley crew uh and they were the this was the station that had the consistently perfectly acceptable rock for mm-hmm. me 
Mm-hmm. There were never any highs or lows, but it was always kind of just a little bit mediocre, but I was cool with it. That's where I heard stained and disturbed and corn and uh, mm. limp biscuit and just kind of took it. They might have played that stuff on WNF FNX, but the thing that FNX I remember it for and what I think it's known for is a DJ named Julie Kramer, who is okay. kind of like a like a music fixture in Boston and like hosts events like the one that I just described, but also she uh, played this. She had this block. I can't remember what it's called. It might have been like leftover lunch or something like that, where she played just like <laughs> alternative music from the last 20 years. But, you know, yeah. it was the 90s. So it was from like the 70s up until the 90s. Yeah, I gotcha. So you would always hear like, I don't know, every every leftover lunch would be Holiday in Cambodia or uh, PJ Harvey or gotcha. s- maybe Super Chunk. So when I heard this record for the very first time this uh, this week, it sounded like a certain time in my life, despite me never having heard the record. Mm-hmm. The production, the guitar tone, the vocals, the song structures, the general feel of the record. I was like, oh, yeah. That was like the that was the pop that was acceptable in my crew. Uh huh. You know, when we were listening to some really gnarly stuff. In the early 90s. What, what, what was really gnarly in the early 90s for your crew? Like Gaster Del Sol. I heard that little stank you put on the, <laughs> the word crew. Uh, it just, was, the stank was, the emphasis stank was more on the word gnarly and then on crew. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, gnarly Gast- crew Gaster in the 90s, Sol. man. We were listening yeah. to Super Chunk. <laughs> no, we weren't listening to Super Chunk. We were listening to um, like uh, Slint. You know, and uh-huh. uh, Rodan. Well, this this and is Gaster right there. Soul, right? Yeah, it like, is right there. But it's yeah. also like this is the. It's almost like now, correct me. I know I'm wrong, but I want you to correct me with, with precision. Okay. This is almost like this sounds like the Blink 182. Oof. At that moment, because oh, Blink 182 bef- before they became, yeah, just a joke, they were, poppy punk. Right? Yeah, I actually that was had really a Blink 182 record before they were a yeah. big deal. Yeah. Um, but I can see why you're thinking that because Super Chunk is a 1990s indie power pop band. They're punk rock influenced. It's a lot of power chords and 4 4 structure. Um, but I think aesthetically, there is like a vast gap between them and Blink-182. Totally, totally. But this is about most position. people who yeah. are unfamiliar wouldn't see it. It's the same thing as when you thought Refused sounded like Stained. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, although I still, I don't exactly know what I'm saying about any of that stuff. But yeah, so. You also once on this show said that Iron Maiden isn't a metal band. Yeah, they're prog rock. But Okay. <laughs> so back to super chunk we should explain the reason why we're talking about this record so delicately is that it's a co-producer pick uh our co-producer kevin wetter has who's been with us from the beginning of the co-producing uh gave us this as an assignment for the winter and uh, i believe i know kevin lives in north carolina i don't know if he lives in chapel hill but I believe that this is a very important record to him because he's yeah. about our age and he's from he the He was area. probably a roadie on the tour they did for this one. <laughs> right. So, yeah, we're talking delicately because this is someone else's pick. But also, I have no preconceptions, except that they sound like Supergrass, which obviously is not true. I have no preconceptions of Super Chunk aside from, oh, yeah, I've heard of them. And so I'm making sure that I don't... Uh, that I don't buy in automatically to the way people talk about how important it was mm-hmm. and that I don't mm-hmm. reject the way people talk about how important it was just based on my missing it. Well, I think maybe one way for you to approach this episode is as if you didn't listen to it, right? And that yeah. will go through yeah. the notes and it'll kind of be like, huh, this is this thing that happened yeah. that I didn't know about. I'm not uh, going to try without and any like subjective jug- judgment yeah, on what it sounds tone. like to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so Cam Lindsay in Vice kind of summed up everything that we just alluded to. 
Cam wrote that no band embodies indie rock more than Chapel Hill, North Carolina's Super Chunk. Now that's like red meat, you know, in a lion cage right there. And I'm just going to let it go by. Uh, Cam Lindsay also appears to be Vice's like go-to resident expert on Super Chunk. There were multiple articles about Super Chunk on mm-hmm. Vice and Cam Lindsay wrote all of them, including interviews done with them. Okay. So uh, Cam continues, they formed in 1989 just as the foundation was being laid for a new decade that saw them, among others, start a musical revolution. Here's a funny thing, Chris. I just picked up from a little free library in which I was placing a number of children's books that we were getting out of the house, Mm -hmm. a copy of Your Band Sucks. The subtitle is Things I saw on the way to the failed indie rock revolution, but can no longer hear. Okay. And what is it about? That? Yeah. I mean, it's about how uh, whatever was happening with indie rock at this moment didn't come to fruition. Interesting. And so this, by bringing this up, you're saying like, this is a, a thing that you potentially agree with. I don't know. I have no idea. I Okay. I saw the title and let me get it exactly right. Uh the author's name is John Fine and his book is called Your Band Sucks. What I saw at Indie Rock's failed revolution but can no longer hear. Okay. I mean, I know nothing about him as a human being, but just the title alone sounds to me like a person who I don't know is upset at a whole entire yeah, totally. era of music and it's just a coincidence. needed to write a screed about it. It's a funny coincidence to me that um, the phrase start a musical revolution, I have an answer to it that I just grabbed because the title was good. But also, so we're only two sentences into Cam Lindsay's description of Super Chunk and you already haven't been able to help yourself, but, but basically take issue with the idea that Super Chunk is A, an important band to some people, or B, an important band in terms of like the lineage of a certain kind of music. I do feel like perhaps you're just waiting to pounce. Well, you you are setting yourself up for this. Why don't we finish the rest of the description? I set myself up for this just by agreeing to do this podcast with you. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Supergrass some more. So okay. Supergrass band, wasn't right? the best selling or most influential <laughs> band of their generation, but they were arguably the most consistent and managed to be so by evolving with each album, which was not always a popular move with their indie rock fans. Now, this is where Cam Lindsay upsets me. Uh, Cam Lindsay says, Super Chunk was also fiercely DIY without ramming the ideal down anybody's throats. Hi, Fugazi. That's a parenthetical that Cam Lindsay could not resist. Yeah. Along with starting the band, vocalist, guitarist Mac McCoffin and bassist Laura Balance launched Merge Records, originally to release seven-inch singles by Superchunk and their friends. Let me interrupt you now, Chris. Yes. I noticed that the way that you dodged the criticism that you levied at me was you prepped everyone to know that you were pissed off about the High Fugazi comment, but then did not make any sort of uh, attempt to explain yourself. Do you want me to? I do. Okay, so the idea here is that somehow Superchunk and Fugazi are diametrically opposed to one another because Fugazi talked, I guess, on stage and in interviews about the ethos of being a DIY punk band, yeah, whereas Superchunk just did it and didn't talk about it. Right, that Lindsay puts them um, in opposition because of the idea that Superchunk was cool about how they were DIY yeah. and Fugazi was militant. They were just cool and they didn't tell you about it. Yeah. yeah. And and so this is like, just in this one paragraph that we still cannot finish, all of these things about <laughs> Super Chunk are being revealed to me. Like this is the history of the understanding of the band. Yeah. Super Chunk is rife with associations. Oh, tons, when I yeah. Was, yeah, when I was on Reddit and I just Super Chunk, I just did the search because mm-hmm. like what could pop up? People were talking about how, you know, oh, I'm listening to Foolish and all I can see is my girlfriend's face or something like this, like mm-hmm. this intensity of how mm-hmm. they reframed Super Chunk in their contemporary moment. Yeah. So I think maybe what you're experiencing is kind of the same thing that I was experiencing, say, when we did the episode on television's Marquee Moon, right? Like you sort yes. of, you listen to it. I listened to it and I was sort of like, hmm, okay. 
and you were like, but this is an amazing revolution that happened and it was so cool. How can yeah. you just be so blasé about it? And I think that's what you're experiencing now is that yeah, the you had reaction. no connection to this. So why would you understand why people would feel that way? Yeah. And then the listener's reaction is, well, this is fine, but it seems like a lot of people are trying to make it important by talking about it because yeah. it's not in context. Yeah. Whereas like, so, and for me, Super Chunk is not a band that I'm in love with, but I know people who are in love with this band and I understand why. Yeah. So we buried one of the other leads here. The guitarist and bassist launched Merge Records, mm -hmm. which I am very familiar with. Um, but obviously not enough to know that Super Chunk was the house band, right? Uh, Merge Records originally to release seven inch singles by the band and friends. Success eventually came, and over the years, Merge became one of the most prominent of its kind, catapulting artists such as. Now, here's the list um, that I think some people might use to pin me to a wall <laughs> Neutral Milk Hotel, Arcade Fire, Spoon, The Magnetic Fields, and Destroyer to Great Heights. So, mm -hmm. uh, I like all those bands, and I love three of them. Yeah. Uh, and none of those are things that I'm particularly interested in, but all of them are things that I'm like, yeah, that's cool. And none of them really sound like Super Chunk. No, not really. I mean, I think it evolved from being a label that was about the Chapel Hill scene to uh, a curation platform for yeah. indie music. Uh, a a launchpad. And yeah. so to sum all this up, a band called Super Chunk uh, released their fourth record in 1994. It was called Foolish. And it was at the same time that the band itself seemed to be driving uh, a record label that is now culturally extremely important. Yeah, so I think the reason why Kevin assigned this to us is a couple reasons. One, it's important to him. But two, it's important to a lot of other people. And three, this was a record that came uh, in the middle of a conflict within this band and within this record label that are now important to a lot of people and yeah. like people look at merge now 30 years later and they go oh wow there's this uh trajectory that you can see from super chunk starting as a band and starting this label to all of this music that i like now mm -hmm. and super chunk being a band that uh is known for quote energetic punk rock style and diy ethics and has come back recently to do an acoustic version of this record mm. as part of the anniversary is, you know, a, I guess, a, a nostalgia act in a way. They were on hiatus for mm -hmm. nine years in uh, the beginning of 2000s. So they were gone and they came back. The bass player uh, no longer plays with them because her, uh, not tinnitus, but hyperacusis. Yeah, uh, she plays with them on records, but not live. Sorry, yeah, so no longer tours. Mm -hmm. Like this is, you know, the 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 early 20s punk energy has been mutated into mm -hmm. the beginnings of middle age. Did you happen to watch the video for the song Driveway to Driveway from this I, record? I didn't. Should I right now? Yeah, give it a shot. It's very 90s. And I think it'll help you understand what this is all about. <laughs> okay, Charlie watched it. So what do you think? Um, I recognize it. I must have seen it. You know, <laughs> It's I don't very 90s. It. It's very clearly like a 120 minutes era MTV. Yeah. That kind of it's thing. It's the short film interpolated with um, uh, kitschy performance. Yeah. So for the listeners who've never seen this before, you can click on it on YouTube. But uh, uh, the video is essentially like a wedding party where different members of the band flirt with the bassist. And then simultaneously, while that's all going on, the band is also playing as the house band at the wedding. Yeah, and being pushed aside by the occasional guest and mm -hmm. sort of messed with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I am surprised that I didn't listen to Super Chunk, but not really. There were a lot of bands yeah, I'm of not surprised either. Yeah. Kind of going into this, I was like, this will be interesting for Charlie because this is a band that was like geographically close to you in the 90s um, and just adjacent to the stuff that you were listening to, but not enough. 
And yet those things that were all listed as like merge stalwarts are things yeah. that you're into now. Yeah. Into now. Right. Yeah. But you know what? I didn't like pavement and anything that was pavement adjacent. I, I just didn't go for. Okay. And now you kind of do, right? Like you've I been talking kind of like about, pavement, like, but I'm totally cool with stuff that yeah. I might've, you know, dodged because people compared it to pavement. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. We've spent about 20 minutes now making you comfortable with this record. Let's, talk to the audience now about who super chunk is as a band what they were up to when they made this record how they made it how they distributed it how it was received and then more specifically i think and this is going at what you're confused about and what i think kevin wanted us to talk about is why this record is so important to so many people yeah so super chunk chapel hill north carolina formed in 1989 as we said um, their original name was Chunk, which was because Chuck Garrison, who was the original drummer, got some junk mail that was addressed to Chunk Garrison, and that became, you know, yeah, let's call it that. Very 90s way to name a band. And someone else had already <laughs> figured that they should call it Chunk, their band Chunk. So our Chunk had to become Super Chunk right, to be its own band. And then uh, they had some personnel changes and chunk garrison left so super chunk is uh detached from its its name yeah and the lineup that is associated with this band now and was on this record foolish consists of jim wilbur on guitar mac mccoffin on guitar and vocals and uh uh laura balance on bass and the drummer is john worster so the the pair that are sort of super chunk from the beginning are the guitarist and bassist. Mac and McCoffin, those are the same two people who started Merge together. And Laura Balance, yeah. And who also were a couple for a certain period of time and now are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you talk to the members of Super Chunk, they basically say, this band started as a plot for Mac McCoffin to woo Laura Balance. Um, Jim Wilbur says, I don't think that they would have ever even been together without Super Chunk being a band. I think they got together because Mac was like, I'm going to teach you how to play bass, and then we're going to start a band. And from there, I'm going to start dating you. So I wonder how many of our episodes we can have like little tiny annotations to. Because like <laughs> our Kim Gordon episode is now in this. Our television mm -hmm. episode is in this. Our Fugazi episode is in this. I, I, I hope someone's keeping a, a running total. McGoffin himself admits that he says, yeah, dating Laura was probably the motivating factor for starting Super Chunk. I said to myself, well, I spend my, all of my time making noise and playing in bands, so Laura should also spend all of her time doing the same thing. In my narrow view of the world, it was like, why wouldn't someone want to be in a band? That sounds fun, doesn't it? All right, so real talk. Yeah. I totally identify with the 23-year-old logic there. Yeah while also recognizing now that that's gross as fuck. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, and not that, gross because like, kind oh, of he's thing. trying to get her, but gross right. because... Just assuming that your interests are like going to be someone else's interests. Yeah, yeah. just don't don't be like, you know, I, I want to date someone and they should do what I'm doing to date them. And, you know, they should be my Kim Gordon. Just, just don't do that. Don't he at that. least seems to recognize that it was a, quote, narrow view of the world. So I don't think this is still something that he's uh, maybe cognizant of as like his... Uh, yeah, that, that's why I started as I identify, because yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. You know, that that's what you would think as a young man. But also, ugh, let's not <laughs> think that way anymore. Another um, thing about Super Chunk that they're kind of known for, Charlie, is that they don't always put all their material on their albums. So they've always released seven inch singles or kind of like bonus tracks that go on things like compilations or soundtracks that you can't find on any of their other records. So let's say that in a different way. They're not beholden to the album oriented rock album oriented radio. They're yeah. not trying to sell just records. They're also trying to sell songs mm -hmm. on occasion whenever that's what moves them. Yeah. So let's start with McCoffin. He's a guitar player and the singer. He's, I mean, the front man of this band. Uh, he has also recorded albums under the name Portostatic, which has it, originally it was just him and then it became like a band of its own. And I think he has solo records now as well. Um, he started off 
as being a part of the straight edge punk scene. And he played in bands called Wax and the Slush Puppies. And Slush Puppies were the support band for Fugazi when they first played outside of D.C. in 1987. So that's where he's coming from. And it, that description doesn't match exactly the feel of this record we're talking about. Not at all. Yeah, but you can sort of see, you know, for Cam Lindsay's kind of uh, snarky th- aside about Fugazi, you can see where the DIY ethics of Super Chunk and Merge Records sort of came into his life. So McCoffin and Balance uh, start dating either in as the band is forming or after the band is formed. And by the time they get to this, their fourth record, they've broken up. So Foolish is kind of this prototypical breakup record. Yeah. It was obvious to anyone who was a fan and keeping track that a breakup had happened within the band and that this record, which is pretty heartfelt, kind of emo-ish, came out in the midst of that breakup. The band is still playing, so they're playing with each other. And yet this record seems to be all of the things that someone is feeling, probably Mac McCoffin yeah. in the wake of the breakup. So in a, in a way, it, it gets grosser because this is a record where he sings songs about their breakup and she stands there and plays them on stage and listens to him sing about his problems with her. But Matthew Fiander reports in Consequence of Sound that the idea that Foolish is about the breakup has been debunked by the band. This is... So the research, I dug as deep as I could in this. <laughs> It is so contradictory because yes. there are actual interviews with members of the band where they say, yes, it's absolutely about the breakup. And then there's stuff like this where he's like, no, it's clearly not. That's been debunked. Yeah. So it's, and I, I think what he's trying to say or what he should be trying to say is uh, the record Foolish was not written to be the breakup album mm, after mm-hmm. they broke up. But the end result of Foolish and its tour became totally about the fact that Mac McCoffin and Laura Balance uh, broke up in the midst of recording. Yeah, I think that's closer. Uh, He also pointed out that 1994 was the same time that McCoffin came out with his first full length for Portostatic. And so there seems to be some kind of overlap there, probably because of what was going on with him personally. Uh, It allowed him to have a chance to write stuff that was outside of super chunk but also music that had quote gentler tones that wouldn't fit in super chunk it all feels like people are saying that that super chunk was forced to grow up at this moment (laughs) maybe uh so let's talk about it from laura balance's point of view um so she started off also in the punk and hardcore scene her first concert was a bad brain show in atlanta that must have been amazing (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but she apparently hung out with skinheads and hardcore kids in the Atlanta scene in the eighties when she was grown up. Um, Michael Roberts wrote this article that we'll uh, link to on the landing page where he said that balance was a key component of super chunks live performances. Even though McCoffin was the one who like creatively wrote most of the music, she was like sort of a, a signifier for the band. I think in a lot of ways, because there was a female bass player, it made people sort of identify with them as just not being an all dude band. Right. He also said, this is the move, right? At the time, there's all those bands that had a woman playing bass to the point where it seemed like an act, right? Mm -hmm. Not, not an act like it's fake, but no, but it was uh, like a a, kind of a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Roberts also says that Balance was a, quote, object of lust for fans who were beguiled by her because they saw a resemblance between her and actress Julia Roberts. In fact, there's a band that he references called Surgery from New York that wrote a song, Dear Sweet Laura, about Laura Balance. Yeah. I didn't know any of that stuff, but I'm not surprised the way that I know, like, friends of mine in high school or early college would talk about women who played bass in other bands. Right. I'm totally not surprised. What's that Kim Gordon quote? Like, uh, does anyone ever say they want to be whipped across the face by Steve Albini's gu- guitar stock? <laughs> yes. And his name is Charlie. 
<laughs> yeah, but I'm the only one and she's never met me. That's a nice uh, foreshadowing for where we're going with this. So in 2013, Balance announced she's not going to tour with Super Junk anymore because she has, as you mentioned early, earlier, hyperacusis. It's apparently a highly debilitating hearing disorder that is characterized by an increased sensitivity to certain frequencies and volume ranges of sound. So it's, it's almost like the opposite of tinnitus in that yeah. like the noise itself is painful. So there's our Mission of Burma reference. Yeah. Okay, so there's an interview with Balance. And uh, it's this long interview that is done by Cam Lindsay on Vice. And it's basically this thing that Vice does where they ask people in bands to rank their own albums and to shit talk yeah, their own I albums. Yeah, I believe the headline is uh, Laura Balance ruthlessly ranks Super yeah. Chunks records. She ranks Foolish as like number four or number three. But in the process of doing it, she reveals a lot about what was going on on this record. Yeah. So Cam Lindsay says that the record's a fan favorite, but she has an answer to that. Balance says, I feel like the reason it's a fan favorite is because it's an emotionally vulnerable record lyrically. It's a breakup record. I think I may have put it higher up on my list, but it was actually painful for me. So I can't put it as number one because I remember being so upset at the time that we recorded and toured for it. Yeah. So she goes deeper into that. She says, when Mac and I broke up, we had discussed what we were going to do with Superchunk. Break up, keep going. We decided to tough it out because we felt like we needed to keep Merge, the record label, and Superchunk going. They were important. But touring for Foolish was so hard. Now, here's the important part, and this is what gives lie to whatever Matthew Fiander was sort of trying to get across. Balance says, listening to those words every night and feeling so mute, I didn't get to say anything. And here he was saying everything. I would be up there jumping up and down with tears streaming down my face. I would try to angle his amp away from me when he wasn't looking. And then she talks about the album artwork, which she uh, created herself. She's a painter. And she said, uh, well, first of all, they wanted to know, Lindsay wanted to know, was it a commentary on the breakup the way that the record was? And Balance said, unfortunately, you know, w when I would make art for Super Chunk Records, I didn't really have a lot of time. So it would be like a one-off effort, and I didn't really practice. And she said, I was inspired to create the cover for Foolish by an American Music Club album. Uh, she thinks it might have been the album Mercury with a photograph of a woman that she liked. And she said, I, I wanted to do a portrait too. Uh, and I was the only person who was available. So she painted herself and she had just watched the Michael Moore movie Pets or Meat. And then she got this idea to put a rabbit in the background. So there's like a rabbit hanging on the wall behind her. She says now, so it was really stupid. Yeah. So I can try and describe it. Uh, at the front to the right is this um, self-portrait, a kind of rough, but not primitive self-portrait of Laura Balance. And then in the background to the left, there's a, a rabbit hanging as if it's about to be skinned mm -hmm. in a kind of church window looking like hole in the wall. So then we hinted at this, but Steve Albini worked on the record before this. He was the engineer, but he also mixed this record and they bring up apparently... <laughs> Apparently, uh, she taught Steve Albini how to breathe fire during the recording process of Foolish and possibly No Pocky for Kitty. Meaning, so this is like a little bit of a, a legendary, yeah. you know, punk rock story. Meaning blowing a cloud of 151 proof rum into the air and lighting it with a cigarette lighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, she says she learned it from John Reese uh, from Drive Like Jehu and Rocket from the Crypt. And uh, his girlfriend at the time, and she thought it was cool. It was this weird, freakish thing that she liked to do. And so she apparently, I don't know if she did it on stage or what, but uh, uh, she then taught Albini how to do it as well. <laughs> Ironically, the first time I saw a band do this, it was a Chapel Hill band. Nice. Yeah. Hey, I want to go back real quick to the cover. And there's a quote from her that kind of, I think is important. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the interviewer. Lindsay says, so much has been read into that cover. And Balance says, right, uh, I knew they would. But at least consciously, 
the process was not probably what people think it was. Right. Yeah. Which, which is like, of course, that makes total sense. So there's mythologizing about yeah. this record. And that's exactly what an artist should be able to say is, you know, I, I made everything coherent yeah. to represent what I was thinking at the moment or what I was feeling, what seemed correct. But the interpretation of it, which is out there, is not going to be exactly what I either intended or was yeah. thinking at the time. Yeah, I think what we're seeing here is that Superchunk are conscious of the narrative that's been constructed around this record, whether they had any part to play in that narrative or not. And now, 25 years later, they're able to look back on it and say, well, yeah, I understand why it's important to people and why they've built this narrative around it, but that's not actually the case. Yeah. So now everybody in Superchunk has other things they've done. Other mm. things, not at the time, like uh, Merge was happening, but uh, by the time Superchunk has gotten to now, everybody's had side projects, uh, everybody's had side businesses. The guitarist um, put out his own music as Humidifier. Uh, John Worster, the drummer, he played with the Mountain Goats and Bob Mould. So he's one of the coolest people in the world to begin with. He's like the... Uh drummer like this the live drummer for both of those bands i think he plays on the studio records too but yeah for like and, the last like 10 years or something like that and he also worked on the best show with tom sharpling uh-huh. which comes up regularly in in my life in my trying to understand the in- entertainment world that we all live in and i've <laughs> never been able to connect with the best show ever yeah we've we've both talked about this and i know some of our listeners are real serious best show fans um but yeah i agree i it always comes up i've tried i'm just not able to get into it but i am fully aware that it's important to a lot of people that are <laughs> that are into the same kind of things i'm i'm into uh yeah apparently worcester uh, like got together with, with Sharpling at some point and he started doing like comedy bits where he would call in as fake characters on the show and now they just do stuff together. So all of that to say that Super Chunk is, is more than just these four people playing music together. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's one of the outlets for all these folks. Um, and then Worcester kind of puts a, a bow on that by saying, Super Chunk gets mentioned whenever the big magazines do an article about vinyl or indie labels, that kind of thing. But they aren't usually that interested in the band. Mm-hmm. And then uh, whoever is interviewing him in this, um, this particular article says that uh, they brought up to Worcester the idea that Super Chunk was always changing its sound like uh, continuously. Not like a re- like oh let's do a completely different sound on this record, but yeah. Super Chunk of uh, No Pocky for Kitty does not sound like Super Chunk right now. And Worcester says, I think we're lucky in that the band has retained the basic sound that it started out with, yet has moved forward to some degree. A lot of bands don't really work that angle. They'll keep the sound, but they won't really expand on it that much. Like with Bad Religion. Oh shit, Worcester. I've heard their really early stuff and their newer stuff, and it definitely sounds pretty similar. That's worked for them, but to me, you need to change things up a bit to maintain your interest in a band. That's that's a fair assessment. I mean, oh, I'm a totally. fan of Bad Religion, uh, but that is an absolute fair assessment of them. <laughs> they they do I, sound, they've for yeah. 30 years been putting out the same record. Hey, I love ACDC and ZZ Top, so I, I got nothing to say against what he said. But I think an important thing for us thinking about Foolish is that... Uh, they are not making the same kind of record over and over again. So foolish is going to be particular to a time yeah. and to part of their evolution of their sound and, you know, what they were working on, what they were trying to bring into the record. Yeah. They see like an evolutionary trajectory. And uh, I would also point out this interview with Worcester comes from 1995. So this oh, is so not just present happened. day Worcester. Yeah. Got it, got it. Um, and so it's interesting to hear him talk about these differences um, because when you look at what Super Chunk sounds like now, it's even more different. And for instance, the idea that they're doing this acoustic version of the record and they did an right. acoustic only set where they played like small theaters, stuff like that. Now Worcester also talks about um, what the what the outside view of the balance McCoffin breakup was uh, Worcester said at the point of the breakup, I just took a wait and see attitude to see what transpired within the band. 
I didn't know how people would get along. People meaning those two. But then we went out on tour and everything was fine. Now, let's point out, Laura Balance clearly said, said everything not. was not fine. Mm -hmm. And Worcester says, actually, it was one of the most enjoyable tours I've ever been on. That kind of reaffirmed my faith in the band. Our tour was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. It made all of us want to keep doing it. And everything's been great since then. So clearly, he at least was unaware of of the emotional turmoil that balance was going through or he was aware and he just didn't talk about it to the press. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. This could totally be, Hey, we're not going to hang anybody out to dry. Yeah. But this is right. Like, can you imagine the interview where he's like, yeah, I mean, our bass player cries on stage every night, but man, we're going to keep doing it. It's awesome. They're getting ready to make their next record at this point. So Mm -hmm. Probably if we went and talked to Worcester now and said, hey, what was it like on that tour? He might say, oh, yeah, you know, we we made sure not to talk about it. But, boy, Laura was upset sometimes. Okay, so foolish has both inside and out a lot of connotations. People um, remembering it as uh, the soundtrack to their youth, but Mm -hmm. also um, enriching that memory with what was going on in the band and with the individuals of the band. At the time. So then we talked about Albini being connected to this. Uh, an associate of Albini's, Brian Paulson, is the engineer on this record. Now, Paulson is now known as both an American musician, a producer, and an engineer. These are the bands that he's known for recording with Slint, Uncle Tupelo, Sunvolt, Wilco, Beck, Archers of Loaf, Dinosaur Jr., Squirrel Nut Zippers, Royal Trucks, Rosebuds, and Mark Etzel. So he is kind of all over the place in an indie sort of way. (laughs) Yeah. And he likes it like that. Um, He said that I got so tired of being strapped into my image as Mr. Organic that I did an about face for a long time. So Brian Paulson, at the time that he recorded uh, Foolish, he had just come from Spiderland by Slint and Uncle Tupelo's Anodyne. Now, I know Spiderland very well. I don't know Uncle Tupelo's record. Do you Mm -hmm. know it? Not really. I've listened to Uncle Tupelo here and there, but they're not something I'm particularly into. Uh, But yeah, Slint, I'm familiar with that record. So Spiderland and Foolish. I mean, there are guitars, bass, drums, and vocals on both records. They're very different bands. Yeah. 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 So Superchunk recorded 17 songs in a three-day recording process. Remember when I was telling you, when we very first started doing this podcast, and we did, I think, our first music episode on David Bowie. No, it was on Iggy Pop. Yeah. And I was like, this is how I understand recording. You go in, you get as many songs done in as short a period of time as possible. You got all the songs ready. You've played them on on tour. You've rehearsed them. Yeah. Now, this is, uh, you know, a recording session that happens right after uh, the breakup of the the singer and the bass player. Um, And it's described as fraught with nerves and tension. So this is where the quote I just pulled comes from. Paulson says, I was known as Mr. Organic live in the studio guy, but after doing that for six years, it gets very tiresome. I had such a knee jerk reaction to that. I got tired of being strapped to that, that I did an about face for a long time. People don't suspect you can do anything else. So let's kind of unpack what he's talking about here. Mr. Organic. What he means is as an engineer, he is not, producing the record with the band he is not defining their sound for them he's setting up the equipment and he's trying to capture what they sound like in the room yeah this is the sort of albini Mm -hmm. kind of ethos and obviously other folks but albini is the one who's been the most um vocal about it and and, uh promoted so this record was both recorded and mixed at steve albini's home studio not electrical audio which is the studio that he's associated with now that he owns i think yeah um but basically he had a studio in his house and a lot of bands were coming through and recording there he didn't record it but he mixed it and so uh, our pulse i guess paulson and uh, uh albini are friendly probably because of the slint connection and some other things there's a cause... whole thing in in an interview with paulson that explains how they know each other Paulson came up uh, playing music in the Minnesota punk scene yeah. and somehow they became associated that way. All right. Um, now 
let's get into Merge Records, which is the label that this came out on, which was run by uh, McCoffin and Balance. They founded Merge in 1989 uh, to be their label, to put out their music and friends' music, um, probably a bedroom label, right? Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, in 1990, Superchunk then signed a contract with Matador, uh, which was a New York label, a small imprint, uh, which then released their first full length, No Pocky for Kitty, which you've uh, talked about, and then 1993 record called On the Mouth. Uh, so they formed Merge and then were like, but we want to go My out and do something bigger. Was that Merge funded the records, Matador handled the distribution. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. And then what happened was, and I remember this distinctly uh, in the early 90s, Matador then signed a distribution agreement with Atlantic Records. And McCoffin said, no, we don't want to be involved with that. And they went back and just did everything through Merge Records. Yeah, they finished their contract. They didn't, like, break it. But after On the Mouth, Super Chunk returned to Merge. And uh, Foolish, which is the record then that they released, was uh, the best-selling record they'd done up until that point. Yeah, so let, let's spell this out clearly. They were distributed by another larger independent label. When that label signed with a major label for distribution purposes, they said, no, we'll do it ourselves. And then when they did it themselves, that record sold better than any of their other records had. Yeah. Matthew Fiander, uh, he describes that the 1994 state of Merge Records. The label, run by McCoffin and Balance, celebrates its five-year anniversary it has grown from selling seven inches from local bands to a full-fledged label, releasing full-length records from the likes of Polvo and the Magnetic Fields. Foolish marked the first full-length album Superchunk would release on their own label. Now, they did have a singles collection before that, but this is the first full-length album that came out on Merge. Yeah. And as Fiander describes it, the new record garnered plenty of praise, sold solidly, and landed the band their first TV appearance. Okay, so the trajectory that they were on, they were getting bigger and bigger as a band, and despite the fact that they changed their distribution method, it didn't didn't stop that train from rolling. Yeah, and despite the fact that uh, the two people who right. uh, formed the core of the band broke up, who were also co-workers co-founders and I, I feel like what we're circling around here is that super chunk was not a not a band that a bunch of people said hey let's form our band and do this thing mm -hmm. it was the uh the outgrowth of all of them working in the industry and trying to figure out their way through the industry mm. so super chunk was going to survive because it wasn't about hey, let's play music together, I love you, or, hey, I want to be the best band. It was more like, how are you a band in the world? How do you handle a label? How do you, how do, you yeah. do promotion? How do you connect with distributors? And so they survived you know, the high pressure of coming back to their label, of the breakup, of suddenly selling more than they had before and going up a level in, uh, in profile. Yeah. So there's no evidence in any of this research to point to what I'm about to say. But I would guess that if you're in a band like this at that time and you're in your mid-20s and your livelihood comes from playing in this band and running this record label when you're at home, that even if you have a big emotional event like a breakup with the person that you do both of those things with, you're probably going to say, well, I want to keep doing this because I would rather have these be my job, even though it's going to be difficult, than say, go work in a record store or go work in a restaurant or whatever, right? Yeah. Did you, was the, the thing about the Ramones in the research here? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the band members mentions the Ramones and says, you know, there was a lot of stress between those, those band members, but they did it. I hope it was fun. But look, like I've mentioned this before, and I don't, I'm not saying Superchunk did this necessarily, but a lot of bands at a certain point start treating it like a business rather yeah. than, you know, a creative project. And so they have to put aside their disagreements or their personality problems because 
the business won't pay them the money they need to live otherwise. Right. Yeah, and they can't be uh, mercurial geniuses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the record came out, and anecdotally, we know that it was really emotionally important to a lot of people. You know, like Cam Lindsay calling it a fan favorite. I found, you know, people posting about how much they liked it. Uh, what happened when it came out? It was best selling for Super Chunk so far, but it was not that big a deal. Yeah. So I looked for sales figures and I couldn't find any. I would note that, you know, when you go and you look up Super Chunk online, this is one of the first records that comes up. That song, Driveway to Driveway, is one of the first songs, And if you look at like their top five songs or whatever mm -hmm. on different platforms. But uh, none of these records from the 90s seem to have, quote, charted on Billboard's top 200. This band started charting in 2010 with their more later releases, though. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure. You might know more about this than I do. Either Billboard has changed its charting... Uh, methodology right and now super chunk is starting to creep into that or they've been around long enough that there are people that are our age that are more likely to buy their records as adults now than did in the 90s when they were first a band that's probably true also it makes sense to me that um, merge became a more efficient and prominent band uh, label thus making super chunk a more you know prominent band exactly. especially connected to merge you know but I mean, knowing that their post 2010 records have broken the top 200, but that this and some of the other early records are considered their best records, I would imagine that over the course of 25 years, this record has sold enough to crack yeah. over, you know, 100,000 copies. Right. But not at the same time. So it didn't yeah. chart. Yeah. yeah. And then it's been reworked it's been mm -hmm. remediated it got a remastered version uh which is what i listened to mm -hmm. uh and it they did the acoustic version that we talked about and toured it uh as a 25th anniversary tour yeah um there was an interview with balance where she said that basically they've been going through their catalog with merge and each time they get to like an anniversary of a particular record they'll remaster it and, and put it back out um, so apparently they've done that with their other records as well. Um, but this is the one that they decided like, we'll do like this acoustic thing for. So yeah, it makes sense too, that this is a label saying, Oh, we've got this, you know, important record. Yeah. We're hitting the 25 years. Let's do it. Well, also let's point out in 2010, one of their new records cracked the billboard top 200 chart. And then they were like, Hey, maybe we should take that record. That's our most <laughs> famous record and remaster it and re-put it out a year later. So here's what McCoffin says about the, the re-release uh, or the acoustic release. 2019 is the 25th anniversary of the Foolish album, and it seemed weirder and more interesting to record an acoustic version of one whole album to celebrate that. I didn't want this to sound like acoustic demos recorded 25 years after the fact or a band trying to rock out except on acoustic guitars. Though, to be fair, we do some rocking out. Once we got into the process of learning how to play the songs on acoustic guitars, some of which we had never performed at all, it made sense to make this record its own thing altogether. And they brought in a bunch of guests. They mm -hmm. have Allison Crutchfield on there, Matt Douglas from the Mountain Goats, uh, Peter Holzapple uh, from the DBs. I have no idea who that is. Me Owen Pallett, who is Final Fantasy and the string arranger on the best Arcade Fire album, and sometimes the only good one. When you said that, all I understood was uh, there's a video game named Final Fantasy. That is true, but Owen Pallet also played solo shows under the name Final Fantasy. Okay. And uh, he did the string arrangements on Funeral uh, by Arcade Fire. Okay. And when they detached from Owen Pallet and became kind of a, uh, a hipster Bruce Springsteen, then they were worse. I think you wanted a, like a response from me there with your pause. I I couldn't name a single Arcade Fire song, so I'm, I'm sorry. I have no opinion on this. I was actually hoping that you would say something about hipster Bruce Springsteen. There are a lot of hipster Bruce Springsteen bands right now. That's, there that, we go. That's I, what I, I was I would say about for. 10 years ago, there was a big wave of, of young indie bands that were like, hey, have you heard this boss guy? Yes, ex that's what I was looking for, man. Now I got to cut this out and put, nah, I won't do that. The Gaslight Anthem comes to mind. 
The songs themselves, he says, extracted from the drama of the moment and what people wanted to write about them are more applicable to real life than I thought they would be. Okay, so here we're getting into some serious like retrospective understanding of what the songs were, what they meant to people, and what they mean now. Yeah. So let me read that again. The front man, Mac McCoffin, says, the songs themselves extracted from the drama of the moment and what people wanted to write about them are more applicable to real life than I thought they would be. Without the embarrassing angst of the 25-year-old, they are just songs about transitions, holding grudges, or trying not to, letting go of things that aren't healthy, moving through difficult situations and relationships, and trying to be normal in the course of all that, even though there's no such thing. So that is a middle-aged person describing a breakup album. Yeah, and it seems like he's a little bit aware that there was some immaturity to the way that he wrote the record and the way that he handled the relationship and that he's probably more aware too of balance's point of view on the whole thing well, 25 they still years work together. later. Yeah. They probably have had the conversations. Yeah. And I do like that. The, he says they're just songs about transitions, grudges, letting go of things, moving through difficult situations. It's like uh, that. Yes, of course they are. That's a breakup record. But so one of the things that I often end up asking you when we do music episodes is, was this particular album that's important to you something that you listened to a lot when you were in a particular relationship or during a breakup or something, right? And so I think that is a key component of why this is so important to a lot of people is that folks who are our age when they were in high school and college, were listening to this record while they were forming relationships with with people that would either, you know, go on to be their lifelong partners or they would have a breakup with and associate the feelings of a horrible breakup with this record. Yeah, I think I I must not have gotten across what I found sort of funny about what he said. The way that he describes these songs saying, oh, if you take them out of the time, they're more applicable to real life because of all these things that they're about that are Mm. real life. Mm -hmm. Part of me is like, yeah, that's what those records are. It's not like I'm, I'm saying to him, yeah, you're just seeing them as an adult now instead of as the kid who's in the middle of them. Yeah. But breakup albums are about grudges and transitions and letting go and, and moving forward through difficult situations. Yeah. And some of them are fantastic. The implication being that this one is not, Oh, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm just trying not to mention that prolonging the magic by cake is my favorite breakup album. Okay. Because I would assume that's a record that you heard when you were going through a bad breakup. Fuck. Yeah. See, so you can identify with why other human beings would really love this record now. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you're having an argument with a straw man, Charlie, dude. No, but like you started off the episode with about 20 minutes of like, uh, yeah, I, I understand this is important to people, but why? Okay. You want to talk a little bit more about Merge here? Yeah. So not only are they putting out, you know, records by a lot bigger bands now, but they're also trying to reacquaint new fans with their old material. So they are doing this reissue series that I talked about. Um, Balance also mentioned that not only did they put out Foolish again and other records again because of the anniversary component, but also because they were out of print on vinyl. And so they reissued the record. She says, we've just been slowly going through the entire catalog. And so here's another one of those like slightly odd, uh, you know, she is a label owner yeah, who has to consider her own work, even work that has all of these emotions attached for her. Right. As part of the label process. She's a small business owner. Yeah. Um, So there was this kind of fascinating back and forth blog post on Consequence of Sound between, I guess, like three or four of their reviewers where they talked about Foolish as a record and Superchunk as a band and why they maybe were or were not important. And... Different people, depending on when they started listening to the band or if they had listened to the band, had different reactions to Foolish, much in the same way that you and I are. Uh, And so this is one of those. Ryan Bray is one of the people that's in this conversation, and we'll, we'll have a link to this article on the landing page. 
But Bray says he doesn't think that there's a benefit to listening to Superchunk as a band chronologically. He says their records all mine similar sonic territory. Which is the opposite of what many people who really listen to Superchunk say. So that's interesting. Yeah, he's sort of having an argument, but not an argument with his colleagues here. And he says, I'm not really sure that running through the catalog from front to back would have given me any cause to look at Superchunk's music any differently than I do now. I definitely think that chronology plays an important role in shaping one's interpretation of a band's music in many cases. But for Superchunk, for me at least, it seems like an exception to the rule. So he's sort of like listening to all the records on shuffle. Yeah. So people have been having an argument about Superchunk all this time, and I haven't been able to join in. Do you want to? No. I recognize the shape of this argument. Mm. Like, I, I've had this argument with so many people about so many bands. It about other bands like, and other records. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, this is the this is the debate that we have about music because it's so subjective whether mm-hmm. whether it mines the same sonic territory, whether it's important to listen in order, whether, yeah. you know, this is the record that really defines their sound, all that kind of stuff. And uh, again, I thought they were super grass. I thought super grass was super chunk. I just didn't have any entree into this, uh, this debate. I think it helps if you think about music the same way that we approach most of the other media that we talk about we always end up having a little bit more of a difficult time with music, even though it's easier to research because we don't traditionally think of music as like storytelling per se. Right. Right. But it is whether that's the intention or not, because the listeners of the music are attempting to make meaning, attempting to form a narrative that helps them understand the world that they live in. And I think this is just a case where, uh, other people were making meaning out of this record and you never had an opportunity to. So you were like, yeah. oh, yeah, well, I get that. I get that you're doing that thing. But why with why with this? Yeah. And immediately the meaning that I tried to make was, oh, I know that guitar tone. Oh, yeah. You know, like that. The guitar is my my way into the record now because I'm like, oh, I, I know that guitar tone. I know that sound. I even know that kind of the strumming Mm-hmm. The sort of style of strumming on that particular uh, chord or whatever you want to call it, the riff, like I can hear that. I've heard that before. It's a very, it's a very, um, I want to say regional, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very much of its time. Kind I have of guitar no sound. idea what their instruments are, but it sounded to me like a Marshall stack with a Gibson guitar. There which go. is a very common sound for bands of this time, right? You've got a like a Marshall JCM 800 or a 900 as your head, a 4x12 cab, and you're running like a, a Gibson Les Paul or an SG through it, maybe with a distortion pedal. That is a very common chunky sound for like post-punk indie bands of the 90s. Chunky. That's what I was trying to say. Hence the name. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, so let's take a minute uh, to talk about Patreon. And when we come back, we uh, I guess we're going straight to the end here to talk about the identity that this uh, record sort of posits. Reading about uh, Merge Records and sort of the ethos behind it and how they conducted business, at least when they first started out, reminded me a lot of uh, how we're trying to run the show, Charlie. Uh, especially because we run through a Patreon campaign and we have a community that makes their own meaning out of the episodes that we're, (laughs) that we're recording and putting out in the world and they help support us. And we are DIY. We are very much. So I never thought that I would be a full on DIY person, but we have our home studios that we put together. We're just sort of putting together what we can when it comes to a recording setup. We uh, certainly have not built these computers by ourselves, but I think that everyone can let that one go. Yeah, most people don't build their own computers, but with the support of our patrons, we're able to do things like pay for our hosting fees or cover our expenses for the artifacts that we research each episode or update the recording setup so that the production's better. Yeah, we say that in every uh, Patreon spot, and I want to take this moment to say... Because we had a Patreon community, 
we were able to budget out what we were going to buy mixers for, how much we could spend on microphones, and we could take the time to do the research and get what we needed. The show mm-hmm. sounds so much better. When I moved into this rely. new space, I was yeah. able to get all of these foam tiles to baffle the sound. There's a lot of things that we've been able to do with patrons that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So you can go to patreon.com slash super context. You can become a patron of the show and you can see what it is that we do when you become a patron. What is the extra stuff that you can get at various levels of support? Well, Charlie, there are rewards. For instance, you get to listen to outtakes or blooper reels of us. In fact, there was a couple good ones during this episode as I was trying to eat in the middle of our recording. Also, there are bi-weekly bonus mini episodes that come out where we address our own consumption of media in the present while also reflecting back on what the episodes make us think of that uh, we would also like to talk further about. Do you mean that we talk shit? Mm, It's only a little bit of shit talking. Mm, Uh, But if you think that's a bonus to try to, you know, lure (laughs) the audience in, then yes, there is much shit talked, uh, (laughs) usually about Alan Moore. And then uh, we also release a monthly extra episode of the show called Super King Context, and they are all about adaptations of Stephen King's work. We are working our way through the catalog, and we are coming up on our Firestarter episode. This is going to be good. George C. Scott. Last month, we did our Running Man episode, and while it wasn't a particularly good movie to talk about, it was fascinating to learn how the movie industry worked in the 80s. Yes. Uh, Cocaine. And wheelchairs. Something that everyone gets, unless they ask us not to give it to them, is a thank you in each episode. And we like to do that here. So first, thank you to our newest patron, B.B. Schwells. Thank you for joining the community. And also, thank you to Alex Laird, Ambrose Allen, Amit Doshi, Bennett Callahan, Beth Barnett, Billy Whitehouse, Brian Chovnik, Caroline Zoids, Chris Marlton, Cliff Landis, Coco, and Dave Jordan. Thank you also to Dave Wachter, Eilish Phillips, Elijah Tilstra, Evan Mapstone, Fred Rasco, Ira James Udiskin, Jason Puckett, Jess Staten, Jill Kaufman, Joseph Aleo, and Junta Slash Cult. Junta Slash Cult. I just want to say it again. Thank you to Calvin Ellis, Carmela Padovich, Kate Sharon, Kevin Wetter, who co-produced this episode as a Patreon reward. To Christian Hirvela, Lee Fowler, Liliana Gill, Lokesh Dakar, Luigi Oswego, Melinda Hale, Miriam Meany, Misha Moon, and Nathan Weatherford. Thank you also to Neil G. McGuire, Nick Sage, Patrick Malka, Pete Bowe, Philip, R.M. Rhodes, the podcast Rain It In Matt and Rachel, Rob Sloan, Robert Negoesco, and Roman Marichek. Thank you to Ron Bilodeau, Ross Llewellyn, Ryan O'Neill, Sari Nichols, Simon Workman, Thomas Tremberger, Veilheit, and Whitney Buchanan. To join this ever-expanding list of wonderful people's names, go ahead and visit us at patreon.com slash supercontext. And we're back. So we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that Superchunk is pretty much a bunch of white folks. I don't know what their... Uh... I don't know if it's even pretty much. I mean, this is a, <laughs> this is a white Southern band. Yeah. I don't know their class background necessarily, but it feels pretty middle class. Um, Their sexuality is not mentioned anywhere in this research. The only point of diversity seems to be that Laura Balance is the one female member of the band. And that's enough, though, for some people to feel like, okay, at least this isn't like another band of all white straight dudes. Right. It, It stood out at the time, but it would not stand out now. Yeah. And the vibe I got from that video was very similar to the vibe from Vampire Weekend. Which is another thing that I'm not familiar with. Okay. so I know it exists, but I've never heard it. Yeah. Let me try and explain the thing that I kind of felt like I was seeing a little bit. Um, A slightly preppy, upper class carelessness, which is very much Vampire Weekend's aura. And their origin story. Yeah. And then uh, Superchunk in that video, they seem to be sort of emulating it 
a little bit, like with the tuxedos mm -hmm. and the kind of, hey, we're all here at a black tie party, but we don't belong, yeah. even though we know how to act here. That video sort of felt like a like a short Jim Jarmusch movie, right? And yeah. Like, you yeah. only get to make something like that if you have the resources to do so, right? And okay, like let's be fair to them. Like they were a successful band for three albums before this, so they probably had some money saved up to do a video like that. But uh, this was not like a band on hard times scraping by. Yeah, and and I'm really just I'm like trying to read the text of the video, you know, yeah. the, this, and the subtext. And so I just have this vague vampire weekend feel to it. Yeah. But I don't have anything to back that up. And now like, here's the thing that's even going to further blow your mind. Vampire weekend is as important to some people younger than us as super chunk was to people who are our age as television is to you. I'm sorry, I lost you in the middle there. So what was that? What was the <laughs> thing about the band? I don't know. What was that middle part again? All right. Let's talk about um let's talk about this thing that is only implied in the record. But like this this record's a, a machine for interpretation mm -hmm. because of the, the things that were happening around it. I we should take a moment to say too, like we're not gonna sit down and like walk you through the lyrics, right? Like those are available if you wanna read what McCoffin wrote for the lyrics of these songs. But these this is how the audience interpreted it. Yeah. So Michael Roberts says it was abundantly clear that McCoffin had a knack for oversized hooks, indelible melodies, and sloppy, passionate performances. All he needed was the time to develop his own style. As the drummer says, Worcester, when younger kids form their own bands, the first thing they try to play is music like the stuff they've been hearing for so long. And then they figure out how to do their own things. So this record is seen as like the first maturation of Superchunk, mm -hmm. the coming into a, their own of Superchunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you've listened to earlier records by them, I wouldn't say that the sound of the band is all that different, but the the approach, I guess, is different. Like, there's a little bit more... It does feel a little bit more mature. Um, I, I remember in one of these reviews, somebody mentioned that, like, Superchunk before this felt like it was just a bunch of kids jumping around in a room trying to make mm. noise and play fast, right? And that this felt like they were making the same kind of songs, but they were, I don't know, approaching it differently. Yeah. Matthew Fiander, that we've mentioned already... He says, there's a darkness to Foolish that is troubling and invigorating. There's no shortage of moments of tension and bile in the earlier Superchunk records, but it sounded different. So they had a song early on called Slack Motherfucker. That's like one of their hits. Yeah. Like In it, fact, it, Mike there Watt with, recorded it with the uh, fire hose, right? Yeah. It, it's up there with Driveway to Driveway. Okay. So... Fiander says, if Slack Motherfucker was bitter, if Precision Auto, which is on Foolish, was aggressive and frustrated, both were still oddly celebratory. And he follows that with this phrase, the comfort in unleashing your own hell was more of a joyful shout than a dark snarl. Hmm. So, yeah, there seems to be this idea that like there's a, a reveling in anger or grief. That Super Trunk is in control mm -hmm. of their feelings of alienation or loneliness or frustration. There's this kind of, um, well, again, I guess the, the maturation, the growing up part. And yeah. so Foolish as a breakup record appears to be uh, a helpful record, a thing that will get people through because it's like, oh, be right. more like Mac. Right. Max yeah. got it down. But they listen to this and they go, oh, okay. If I can sort of emulate this role model, how he's approaching his breakup, it will help me to do the same thing with mine. Yeah. Fiander says that the record towed the line between these two things, between shedding frustration and getting tangled up in it. So it wasn't a don't worry, be happy, get over it record. And it wasn't a I'm dying record. Um, he says it's a record of confusion of searching for answers in places where there aren't necessarily any answers to be found. Mm -hmm. And so it's about, I mean, I don't hear this at all because 
I'm just coming to it as a object to be sort of understood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I know that feeling of listening to a record and saying, oh man, you know, I think I can use this as like a crutch of like values and mm-hmm. lifestyle to just kind of get me through this time. Right. I'll just, yeah. I'll just be like this for a little while. I'll use this particular phrase as a mantra to get me through this weird ass breakup time. Yeah, exactly. So this is like, for some people, the quintessential breakup record because they knew that the person singing the songs on it and the people playing the music on it had experienced a breakup in the way that almost everybody has, right? And yet we're staying together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, The last quote here about sort of the identity of this record and, and what people take away from it, the meaning that they take away from it, also comes from that consequence of sound sort of debate. Uh, And the other uh, writer there, his name's Josh Terry. He says, though their remarkably consistent discography has made the task of ranking their offerings almost Herculean, I'd argue that the mood, execution, and fantastic songwriting of Foolish have kept it in the band's upper echelon. So let's let's decode that from like pretentious record guy. Uh, He's saying... I think that this is one of the most important super junk records. Yeah. It's hard to tell what's important about super junk because they're really good. It's hard to rank them, but this one, because of its mood execution and songwriting is really important. So I want to, I want to end with something that I almost feel like maybe we should have started with. Yeah. Uh, I already said mine, but what's your favorite breakup record? And can you imagine continuing to work with and playing music any of your exes i've done it okay yeah so i played in a band with my girlfriend who was the bass player and i was the singer guitar player and uh we broke up and we continued playing in bands together after that chris and we even lived together Matt in the coffin <laughs> is this like a witness protection thing yeah yeah it's me I pull off my Scooby-Doo mask. So how would you describe, like, obviously now retrospect, how would yeah. you describe that process? Um, in some ways it was difficult, but in other ways I was able to understand that our relationship, especially our working relationship, uh, did better as friends than as partners. Mm. And that yeah that like we were able the projects were better for it afterward how long did that working relationship go (sighs) a couple of years yeah nice um we lived together for a year or two after that and then um we continued playing in bands along that time too yeah i have been such a jealous wreck after my breakups I've got like four or five that are pretty significant that looking back now, it's like, God, I don't know why, why was that so important? Why was I, un, why was I debilitated, you know, by this? Um, and I kind of wish now that I had tried to work with or create with mm-hmm. my exes. I think that that would have, that would have healed me a lot quicker. And also I think probably would have given uh, them a chance to, sort of work out whatever it was that I just like refused them, you know, the, cause like I cut off connection with them and like, no, fuck off. We're done. Get away from me. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly because of infidelities, but also just, just slamming everything shut and trying to get away from a relationship. It was like, it was like cheating in a way, you know, it was like, like dodging the, the final process. Yeah. So this record almost feels like a model for, you know, how you might get through a breakup and be a better person on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can handle it, if you can um, be a productive member of society with your ex and also tell people about the end of your relationship in a way that they can relate to. Like you, this record doesn't resonate for me as a breakup record. Even though I'm familiar with it, I don't know every lyric. I don't 
I, I haven't uh, written the narrative. I haven't made meaning yeah. of it in the way that, that most people have. Um, but after listening to it a couple times yesterday and doing the research for this episode, it did make me start thinking about my past breakups. And what one huge difference between you and I is, as far as I know, there were no infidelities. So that's good news, I guess, on my part. But, Listeners, please write in. Yeah, if, if you know anything. Uh, but... I would say that I look back on all of my past major relationships that had breakups and all of those breakups were because of me. I know that uh, I was the one bringing the problems to the table and I, I don't know what it's like to break up with someone because they were the one who wronged me. You've been listening to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. How it's made and how it informs our everyday culture. Our theme music is Human Factor by Mile Marker. And right now you're listening to Drive Fast by Three Chain Links. Show notes and all our past episodes are available at supercontextpodcast.libson.com. You can email the show at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com to tell us what you like, what you don't like, and to suggest topics for future shows. And I'm available on Twitter as at Christian Saker. And I'm there at Bennett Radio. Two N's, two T's.